Good afternoon once again, and welcome to this last session of the webinars at the academic conferences from CBA La Paz. This time we will present Pedagogy Behind the Technology by Gonzalo Fortun from the U.S. Embassy. Mm -hmm. Gonzalo is an English language specialist of the U.S. Department of State, manages the Office of English Language Programs of the U.S. Embassy in Bolivia. He has taught English for over 25 years and has been a teacher trainer, curriculum analyst, and curriculum designer for over 12 years. Doctoral student in Education and Educational Research, M.A. Tissol from Arizona State University, USA, MA Education from CEPI, San Francisco Javier University, a Diploma in Higher Education from CEPI, San Francisco Javier University, BA in English and Quechua from San Francisco Javier University, Level C Certificate in English Language Teaching Methodology from Global TESOL College. He's a teacher trainer from the Education and Cultural Bureau USA. Thank you for joining today, Gonzalo. We are very honored to have you as part of this great event. It really means a lot for CBA La Paz. <laughs> No, uh, I need to thank Cibie La Paz, actually. Uh, number one, for, for, the, for the invitation. And uh, even more importantly, because of, of the effort to really support, you know, like their English teachers in, in what's really needed now. Yes, and thank you for supporting events like this. Mm -hmm. Well, I will leave you now with your audience, okay? And and you can start the presentation. Thank you, thank, thank you. you, thank you, thank you very much. So um, when, when I first was contacted by the CBA in you know, about these conferences, I, I started thinking about uh, what would actually be ideal. So my first question was like, what's the main thing of, of the conference? And uh, so I was told that it was like technology, you know, like, uh, which is what we need nowadays we're doing um, the COVID times, you know, and, 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 and I totally agree with you. Know? I mean, I think that technology is, is fundamental. But, but I really decided to go, to go beyond that. And this is why I'm, I'm presenting on the pedagogy behind this technology. And um, and let me share something with you. Let's, let's, let's make it, let's do it like this. Um, I would like you to focus on the little, Pictures that you that you see here on your screens, and I want you to follow uh, uh, a story that I'm going to read for for all of you. Um, meet Richard. Richard is a very handy man with a lot of talents. He hardly ever needed to rely on anyone for whatever it is that he needed to do at home. He had all kinds of tools he wisely collected over the years. However. One good day, there was a big problem at home, and he had no water. He started analyzing the situation, and with Mr. Google's help and support, he figured what the problem might be. The mainstream pipe broke and needed fixing. So he thought to, my, to himself, and he said, this is what I've been waiting for. This is what I've been training for. I can finally use my tools for real. Well. He soon realized that what he had was not enough, since what he lacked was knowledge of how the pipe system was installed and how to operate heavier machinery. So he not only not fixed his water issue, but left his entire neighborhood with no water for three days. What a mess. I want you to keep this story in mind because I think that that Richard resembles many of us, many, many, many teachers in general, not just like English language educators, but I mean educators in, in, in any language. 
Um, Daniela and I, you know, my moderator, we were chatting before the presentation about how is that this, you know, struck with no warning and like nobody was actually ready to do this. You see, nobody was ready. So there's, there's a, a rhetorical question that I want to ask that needs no response. This is just for you to wonder. And the question is, what is actually the difference between traditional education, you know, the face-to-face -face one, and the one we are working on at the moment? What is really the difference? This is something for you to ponder. What is the difference between traditional education and the one we are working on at the moment? You don't need to type in in the chat box any responses. This is just for you to start thinking. And, um, and I'm very sure that that when you start thinking about this, you immediately come up with with some ideas, you know. And uh, and and one of the very important points that that come up is is technology, you know. So, what is the importance of technology in online education? And this is a question for you to to answer. So, if you can actually type in your responses. So, Daniela, maybe you can help me read some of the comments that we have in the in the chat box. I'm looking at YouTube right now, sure. but there's a little delay. So, if you can help me, that would be great. What is the importance of technology in online education? Okay, so we are already waiting for your answers in the chat box. What is the importance of technology in online education? Yes. Okay. yes. So please. Well, I think from my point of view, um, we are living in a different century and we have to move along with everything that comes up, right? Mm -hmm. And technology is one of the things that is con constantly changing and improving. Mm -hmm. True. So True. Anna from the audience says, it helps to keep the students engaged and motivated. Yeah, I like what, what Fernando, Fernando says. says. It's a key factor. Yes, I agree with that very much. It has become an important tool to reach your goals. Nowadays, it's so important. You know, I, I totally agree. I, I think that technology has become one of the most important tools, you know, during during these times in which online education has has come like so, so important. There's, there's a saying that I used several times during other presentations and, uh, and, and I think it's so appropriate now. It, it says that teachers will not be replaced by technology. And this is something I hope, honestly. But teachers who do not use technology will be replaced by those who do. You know, this is, this is a little bit sad as well. Because for many, many years, we've been training in the use of technology from like many different perspectives. And we've been being told that that those tools were important, but, but there was a lot of reluctancy, you know, on behalf of, of, of a lot of educators, not just English teachers, but like all educators. And, uh, and I know as a fact, and, and this is something that I feel like deep in my heart, like a, a very well-known institution in Bolivia has, um, has actually, uh, not continued working with a high number of teachers who voluntarily decided to step off. You know, they just felt that they that they couldn't handle this situation, that it was too much. They were fantastic teachers, but but they just couldn't handle the technology necessary to I would use this word to survive. You know, like in this in this COVID nineteen times. And that's really sad. It's really sad because when we go, you know, to 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 theory and, and, and we see what Lee Shulman says, and when he talks about like what do you need to know when you want to be a teacher? And he's not only talking about English language educators, he's talking about educators in general. So he talks about different kinds of knowledge, you know, that that, that educators should have. So he talks about content knowledge. That's like you, you need to know 
what you are teaching. So in this case, if you are an English teacher, you know to you, you need to know English. If you don't have English, then it's going to be very difficult to be an English teacher. If you're a math teacher, you need to know math. You, you need to have like knowledge about like general pedagogy, uh, like the the general knowledge of of the science of of teaching you you need to also have knowledge about um, psychology you know psychology of teaching and psychology of the learner as well you if you're an English teacher you, you need to have you know knowledge about the specific ways in which English is 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 taught you know so this is the, the, the pedagogical content knowledge, a little bit different from that general pedagogical knowledge. You, you need to have knowledge about your educational context. So in this case, this is very important because, because we sort of like lost the context that we were used to, you know, because we don't have our, our classrooms. We, like I remember like for, for many years when I taught uh, at a sister um, institution, in CBA Sucre, I had my own classroom, you know. So it was it was this place where I felt like really comfortable. And 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 not only I, I felt comfortable there, but I like knew my students so much. I knew more than just you know their student side that I felt that I was really being an educator. You need to know about like aims and objectives, you know, like this comes from what you're teaching as well as as from from your institution, you see. Um, I'm a believer that that like all educational institutions administration, they should have like very frequent conversations with their teaching staff so that they all are on the same page, you know, like definitely the material that you're using to teach, you know, like your curriculum, you need to know what you are using to teach and um, the accumulated wisdom. This is the know-how. Know-how is, is it's an expression being used in every single language now, and that is something that you that you sort of like accumulate with with time. But you know, besides this, which is what all educators should have, now we have that technological knowledge. You see, which is which is necessary. And I've been uh, following most of the presentations for these past three days, and I've seen like beautiful stuff. You know. Um, you need to have like technological knowledge on the kind of programs that 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 you are using if you are using computers. Like uh, right before we started, we had a, a minor tech problem. You know, like I couldn't uh, show my slides, and but I I knew how to fix it, so I just followed. You know, my knowledge in 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 that case. If you are using cell phones, then. You you need to have some knowledge about the different apps. And I've seen different ones that were presented during this, these days. You have to have knowledge on the LMS, you know, the learning management system that you're using in your institution, whether it is uh, My English Lab, you know, that comes from, from Pearson, or, or if you're using Edmodo, if you're using Moodle, if you're using Canvas, if you're using Schoology, like it, you need to know your LMS. And you need to know because there will be problems and you will need to know more than just the regular user's knowledge. But you need to know a little more. You need to know, you know, you need to have knowledge on, on sound and video. You're going to be producing videos or producing, you know, like sound clips. Like you, you need this because it's it's always been said that when we don't have the knowledge, we can rely on someone. But, you know, this someone now has closed to to your family circle because we don't really have contact with a lot more people you need to have knowledge about the internet you need to have this this is this is very important because this is very related to your educational context you see like you need to know whether your students have or not you know like internet access and if they have internet access, how good that internet access is. Because all those marvelous, you know, marvelous tools that I've seen during the, these past three days are fantastic. But I, I have actually not heard anyone talking about how much bandwidth those tools need. If they work equally well on data as they do on Wi-Fi. 
and if on Wi-Fi, again, what the bandwidth should be for, for these tools to work well, you know. So, but you need to know this because otherwise you, you can dream, you know, you can dream about using this and this and this and this and this, but what if your students don't actually have the means to access and, 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 and work on this? You know, um, Daba and Bannon presented this, this learning cycle, you know, for, for online learning that I think that we need to take into account. As in, you've been trained during these days on learning technologies, you know? I think it's fantastic. I think that every single tool that I've seen being presented these days were fantastic. But I was also uh, very... Um, positively surprised when I saw, you know, like some of the, some of the topics that were being presented, you know, that, that, that talked not necessarily about uh, only mm, technology, but also on creativity, on, you know, like creating this community for students to develop, you know, their, their motivation, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you, you need to understand that pedagogical models, constructions, to think about the way in which people process information when learning, this is, this is very important. And, and this is also nice. And I was very surprised when I saw this also among the different presentation because instructional strategies have changed. Like whoever is, is the educator who thinks that he can teach in a Zoom class exactly in the same way that he used to teach in his class, he's gonna fail as, as an instructor, as an educator, you know? Because, because it's not the same. Like you don't have this personal contact with your student anymore. It's, it's more difficult to really provide um, you know, student-student interaction, like student-teacher, teacher-student interaction, it's okay, you can do that. But student-student interaction, it's, it's kind of hard. So this whole thing is important. You need to create a community of learning. A community of learning came by itself as uh, organically, you know, in your, in your class when you were teaching face-to-face. But now it's not so organic any longer. You need to create this. You need to sponsor the creation of a community of learning. This is your students' relationships, you know, like among each other and with you and you with them. And, and, and also a community of practice, you see. And this is not, not your students anymore, but this is you, the teachers. Like in the past, you used to meet in the teacher's lounge, you know, like every, every hour, every two hours, every 90 minutes, who knows? But this is not happening anymore. But this needs to be promoted. You, you need to have this community in practice in which, in which everything that you are learning, which is new, um, can, can be shared, like good and bad practices, you know? I mean, I'm, I'm very fond of best practices, but I think that I'm more fond of like failings, you know? Like bad practices. Because when you make mistakes, it's when you realize what needs to be improved. Are we okay up until now? I hope yes. Now, what happens is yeah. that nowadays, sorry, Daniela? No, I just okay. wanted to tell you that everything's fine. Thank you, Walter. Okay, perfect. Thank you, thank you. So the, the idea here is that that when you when you see, you know, what you're doing and when you see your your class. Like you, you're now looking at little squares, you know, and, and, and those squares um, have like video, like live images, but that's not what your students are, you know? So your students are still people and we teachers are still people. So we need to find a balance between the different kinds of assignments that you assign and that you receive, you know? You, you, you need to find um, a balance about the different video tutorials that you're giving your students, either the ones that you are producing or the ones that you ask them to, to look for or the links that you provide them. You need to find a balance, you know, with like live classes and, and, and maybe others that are not live, you see. You need to know when is okay to have a live class or when it's better to have a webinar, you know, like the one that we're having now. Like, when do you really need 
you know, like live interaction. When do you really need people to talk to you, like to talk back to you? Or when it's okay if they can come to you in a chat box, you see? Why is that? Because feedback, feedback is like more important than ever before. Why? Because we are creating this community of learning. Like you really need to know what is going on on your student's end because, because eye contact, it's, it's hard. And I don't mean because of my blue screen, but I mean because it's difficult for teachers now to keep eye contact. In a, in a recent workshop that I was part of, uh, a dear friend of mine said something that I'm, I'm using and I'm using it all the time, which is when I'm giving a webinar or when I'm teaching a class, I'm not looking at my screen. You see, I'm looking at the camera because that way, like the person who's on the other side, it's actually feeling that you're looking at them and that you're talking to them. You see, interesting, interesting point. We need to find a balance. Not everything needs to be live. You know, when we talk about live teaching, we're talking about synchronous activities, right? Not everything needs to be synchronous. I've heard parents complaining by saying, no, my students, you know, sorry, my, my kids um, school is not doing a good job because, you know, like they, they only have Zoom for like one hour a day and they used to go to school for six hours a day. Well, there's there's a big problem there because sadly this, this parent lacks of knowledge. Uh, he should understand that you cannot have somebody for like five, six trade hours, you know, in front of a, of a screen, you see? You need to balance synchronous activities with asynchronous activities. This needs to be balanced. Like your students need to be able to do a lot on their own. And synchronous classes, this is live classes or Zoom classes as they call them now, they need to be focused on active learning, you see? So you cannot be, you know, like doing all activities that you used to do in class and to do them over Zoom now. So what happens is this, up until now, I've been talking a lot about all of those tech tools that you've been learning, learning how to use and even using. But there's there's a much bigger question, and this is like the, the core of, of this presentation. When to do what? You know? Like, I'm learning about the Blah Blah app. That seems to be fantastic. I love it, you know? Like, I'm thinking that my students will have like a fantastic time with this. Oh, this is really going to make my life a lot easier. But, but there's, there's a question, and the question is, when to do what? So look at this. We're going to be using these two variables, immediacy and band bandwidth, you know, because you really need to play with these two variables. Why is this? Let me introduce you a matrix. You know, this is a matrix that was introduced this year, actually, like a few months ago by Daniel Stanford. You know, this is a, a very interesting matrix that balances immediacy and, and bandwidth. You know, so to be, to give you an, an example, um, if you are planning to use email, for example, that I don't know how many of you guys use email, but 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 email is fantastic, and and why is it so good? Because it really requires low bandwidth. You don't. It, it's it's low in, in data consumption. It doesn't consume a lot of megas. You know, it doesn't eat your megas. So take that into account. But it has its pros and cons, you know, because when you talk about immediacy, it has low immediacy. Why is that? Because culturally, we are not used to checking mail that frequently. Danila, how often do you check mail? 
Uh, well, uh, every day, right? Because uh, it's part of my job to check my mail. That lately I've been getting lots of mail from Google Classroom and some important messages sometimes stay yes. behind. Yes, mm -hmm. and I understand that perfectly because you have a lot of uh, mails coming from, from Google Classroom. Your students are also getting a lot of mails from Google Classroom and even more from Instagram, Facebook, you know, all yeah. the social media that they are part of, you see? So that is a problem because important email get lost, you know, like in the pile of emails that you have. You see, so that will be a cons because that affects directly on immediacy. So you really need to balance, you know, like if you're going to be using email, then you know that it might actually take a little while. But but you see, we can actually start playing with with discussion boards with like texts or images. And you may want to use, you know, WhatsApp, for example, or I've seen uh, many schools using Telegram now to sort of like set the difference between what's social and what's uh, what's educational. Not that Telegram is educational, it's just that in, 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 in our culture, uh, we're more a WhatsApp culture than a Telegram culture, you know? So many teachers uh, are drawing the line there and they say like, okay, keep on using WhatsApp for social and let's just focus on Telegram for, for educational, which, which I think it's fine too, you know? And honestly, like if you send, um, pictures, you know, like even videos in, in WhatsApp. Um, videos are automatically um, downgraded, you know, like in resolution. So so that you so that you are not like, you know, consuming so much data. You see, um, there's there's so much that you can do with like reading, you know, using like texts and images. So so why would I consider this? Like when to do what was our big question, remember? So when would I use this? When when I'm not going to require a lot of bandwidth because I know that my students don't have access to like a really good quality internet or when I don't need, you know, like my, my students immediate response. So, so this is something that you need to, to start playing with, you see? You need to know when to do what. Then, if we move on to, to the right, you will see here, for example, um, that, that you could use collaborative documents, you know, like, for example, all those Google Docs, you see, or, or a group chat and, and messaging. When you want to have higher immediacy, but still keep, you know, like low bandwidth. You see? So I don't know how many of you have actually tried to use collaborative documents, you know, like having uh, 10, 15, 20 students um, collaboratively working on a single um, document, you know, interactive document. But but that works marvelously. And, and, and it actually eats up, you know, like very low megas, like speaking the language that our students uh, use. Then if you're still, you know, like not so concerned about immediacy, so you still have time, you want to give your students time to react, you, you may want to rely on maybe, maybe not having, you know, live classes, but maybe sending your students pre-recorded videos, you know? I mean, I can understand. I made a presentation last year around this time in Santa Cruz about producing your own videos and a lot of colleague teachers, you know, like experience stage fright, you know, like they just didn't feel like being on the screen, but come on, you're on screen now anyhow, you see? And, and I don't know if you know, but you can record the complete Zoom meeting. So, so this is just like having a video. But when you send your students a, a pre-recorded video, like research shows that your students actually watch that video several times and not just the one time that you expect them to watch. You see, same thing happens with pre-recorded audio. Like podcasting has become, you know, like very relevant nowadays because of all these reasons, you see? Or asynchronous discussions with video. I mean, using your WhatsApp group and asking your students instead of typing if they could send 
uh, you know, like video messages or, or audio messages. And, and, and this works marvelously. And of course, of course, of course, that we need to, to get to this matrix, you know, the one that shows high bandwidth and high immediacy. And what is that? It's actually what, what we are looking at now, you know, like it's, it's a live classes that, that you guys have in Zoom or Meets or Teams in, in whatever platform you have. So I want you to, to have a good look at, at, at this matrix because um, and you will have a copy of, of this whole presentation afterwards. I'll let you know how. Because I think that, that this is just as important as the technology that you're using. Actually, this will define the kind of technology that you want to use. So not only be driven, you know, like like Richard, you know, in the story that we told about collecting, you know, like all these different tools, because maybe they're not okay to be used when you need to use something. Or maybe you're actually required to use something that's too big for you, you know, and then just like Richard, you, you feel useless, you see? So the Daniel Stanford uh, matrix that I just shared with you, I think it's fantastic. And, and more important than the technology you use is to think about why is that you're using what you're using. You know, I mean, you want to use the, the, the Mentimeter, fine, but why? Why are you going to use that? I mean, why do you need immediate response from your students? I'm not saying don't, I'm saying why. So if you have the, the, the right response, then go ahead and do it. But don't do it just for the sake of trying something new. There needs to be, you know, like a pedagogical reason that backs up your choice. Otherwise, maybe it would be better if you just like put off the, the use of that. Okay? So that's like the, the first way to, to, to face, to, um, to really confront, you know, the, the when to do what. Um, I don't know if, if there are like any, any questions about this first part. Um, so Daniela, please, please like feel free to, to, to interject with me if, if there are like coming up questions. I don't really see many coming up. Okay. Um, okay. So now for the sake of time, we'll go into, into another way to face the, the when to do what. Um, let me introduce you the, the pig rat model for technology integration in teacher preparation. This, this is another way. So we're not talking about immediacy and bandwidth anymore, you see? Now this is a different perspective to consider when to do what. And, and we're actually talking about this, I don't know if you've seen this matrix, the pig rat model matrix. But, but if, you, if you see like the, the name, you know, it's, it's more like a mnemonic. It comes from, from the initials of what we are going to look at. So, uh, let's start with uh, with a with a vertical, you know, with the pick part of this. So we're going to be focusing on the P first, which stands for for passive. And the idea is this: so think about the technology you are using. So is the technology you are using producing, you know, the idea of your student receiving content passively, and maybe that's what you want. Maybe what you want is for your students to, to listen. This is one of, the, one of the objectives of a webinar against a, a live class, for example, or a live session. So in a webinar, what you want is for the participants to be actively listening, you know, so they are not talking back to you. Uh, the I stands for interactive. So when we talk about interactive, we don't mean interacting, you know, only with a technological tool, you know, with a tech tool, but interacting with content and interacting with other learners. Because this is something that, that, that used to happen all the time when you had a class, but now you need to promote it. So, so is this what you want? 
The idea of playing games, the idea of taking adaptive tests, the idea of manipulating simulations, problem solving, you know, that gives you uh, the chance to really reach, you know, interactivity. Then we reached to the big C and we talked about creativity. I think it was yesterday. And, and the idea here is to always make the difference between um, what uh, Saturnino de la Torre introduced, you know, in, in Creatica. Um, and this is like the big C or the small C, you know, like when you talk about the big C, you actually talk about creation, you know, the idea of, uh, of doing something out of nothing. You see, the, the, the actual idea of create. But let's not forget the small c, because the small c also talks about the idea of, of modifying, the idea of adapting. That is also creative, you know? So it's not always to, 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 to do something out of nothing, but it can also be to change. So when we talk about creativity, we're actually talking about the idea of, uh, of producing something. You know, so so you really need to focus on a technology that 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 supports production on behalf of of your students. You see, it could be audio, it could be video. You know, I mean, it, it could still be on digital paper. You know, like like writing, posting, uh, either WhatsApp or Telegram or email or whichever way that you want to do. Uh, role playing. You know, I mean, it's still part of this. Then we go into the rat portion of this. So the rat portion goes into replacing. So the, the idea here is um, it's okay if, if, if teachers use a technology that replaces something that used to happen in, in class, you know, in, in a face-to-face -face environment. It's okay. Like none of this is bad. It's just that you need to identify where you are with what you are doing in order to respond to the when to do what. Um, but don't forget that technology, it's not supposed to only replace what you used to do in class, but it could actually amplify, you know? I mean, there are things that, that technology can help you do that in regular circumstances you couldn't. You see, for instance, like asking your students to, to write down a paragraph was something that used to happen in class all the time. But, you know, if you're using uh, a, a Google Docs or, a, or, a, or um, you know, like a cloud uh, office document, you can now have and provide feedback, even, even live feedback, you see. So you could be, your students could be writing and you could be reading at the same time that they are writing, which is something that couldn't happen in class. So this is the way in which technology not only replaces, but amplifies, you see? Or using Logger Pro, you know, like when you're asking your students to do research and collect data, you know, for further analysis, you see? So it's important for you to think. Or you can even go a step further, which is to transform. You know, so when do we arrive, you know, up on this stage of the transformation? This is simple. It's when you take away the technology, the activity just couldn't happen. You see, there's so much that you can do with technology that without that technology, it just did, wouldn't happen. So nowadays, for example, like, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm in La Paz. And, uh, and you guys are also in the past, but I could easily be somewhere else. And I think that some of the uh, presenters, you know, the guest speakers from the publishing companies, I think that a few of them were not in La Paz. So without technology, that just couldn't happen. Like, I don't know if you remember pen pals, like having, you know, friends like uh, abroad, you know, abroad, like in different countries. So now that can happen so easily. You see? So you will actually be transforming what happened in class now with the use of technology. So summarizing, what, what, why am I introducing the pig rat model? Because it's important for you to identify where you are with the technology that, that you are using. You see? For example, 
For example, if, if you have a lecture, you know, with a PowerPoint, because many of us do that, like I'm doing this right now, like, where am I? You see, where am I with a lecture with a PowerPoint? If I'm using a PowerPoint in class, in a Zoom class, where am I? I'm here. It's passive. My students are not doing much when I'm presenting with a PowerPoint. And I'm just replacing something. I mean, I could be using my whiteboard. I'm just using a PowerPoint instead of using my whiteboard. Do you see what I mean? The idea here is to really locate where you are. I mean, where your practice is, actually, not you. Like students with a PowerPoint presentation, because your students can also share the screen, you know, and they can use a PowerPoint presentation. So where are they? Actually, it's it's also replacing because they could do the same thing on paper, but but this is higher in, in, in creativity. So this is asking more on the creative level. So even on the rubric that you use to, to assess your student's work, for example, you could definitely give, uh, you know, part of the point or using one of the descriptors could focus on, on this aspect. Digital flashcards. Like, I'm very sure that people, teachers now use digital flashcards. Make a guess. Where do you think a digital flashcard is? Let's see. Yes, it's it's interactive. You know, it's producing, it's it's fostering interaction, and it's replacing something that you used to do in class because we used to have the, the ones that come in books. You know, or many teachers actually stopped using the ones that came with books and used like cell phones. You know, with a picture here as as a digital flashcard. Like journal in the blog. I don't know how many of, of, of you foster the idea of writing blogs, but you know, this is great because it would still replace the idea of your students working on a notebook, but it's highly creative, you see? So I'm not saying which one is better than what. I'm just saying that you should be able to identify where you are, you see? There's so much space in this, in this matrix and all of these activities are still there. You see, explanatory videos, you know, the ones that teachers produce to, to offer explanations. You see, look where they are. They are passive because your students are not doing anything, you know, except obviously being actively listening. But you see, an explanatory video amplifies. Why? Because when you give an explanation in a Zoom class, let's play this really quickly. How many times? Can you repeat your explanation, you know? Versus how many times can a student watch your video? You see, then you see why it amplifies. Skype expert chat. Wow, I mean, of course, that couldn't happen without the technology. That's why it's under transform, but your students are still passive. A, a project-based learning video game. Hey, you know, the project-based learning video game, fosters interaction among your students, but it's also something that couldn't happen if you were like in a, in, a, in a regular class. A video documentary, for example, we've done this several times, but you see, what if you ask your students to produce video documentaries? What if you ask your students to focus on something like this as a final project of the book, for instance, you know? Then you're transforming what you are doing and you're reaching high levels of creativity. You see? So this is why the pick rat model should be essential, you know, like in any educator's backpack. Because it allows you to really not only focus on the technology that you're using, but to focus on the pedagogy behind the technology. Like, why do you want to do it? And, and, and what's the reason that, that makes you use certain technology over uh, a different one? And when you look at this, either from the immediacy band with um, matrix or from the pick rat matrix, then you start getting those questions that every educator should have. Otherwise, we are just artisans of our profession, you know, and we don't want to do that. To finish, everybody has talked about the flipped classroom forever, you know. This was actually introduced back in 2012. But I think that nowadays, 
it's it's even more important. So I'm not going to go deep into explaining what a flipped classroom is, although nobody referred to this during these conferences, but you can find information about this everywhere. So just for you to see, flipping classrooms, it only means, you see, to take the traditional elements that were part of your class, to take them out of the class, which will give you enough space in time in the class to do what you generally can find time for. If you remember what I said, for example, about um, being your Zoom classes dedicated to active learning, your students shouldn't be in your Zoom class listening to you talk and talk and talk and talk and talk, because you can do that in a video. So, that is the idea of flipping your class. You know, I can take my talk, 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 talk out of the class so that when we are in class, we can use the prior knowledge that came with the talk, talk, talk that they have before. Having your students read, you know, like in your Zoom class, like why would you waste your time having your students read unless, unless, they are reading aloud and you're using reading for pronunciation and intonation. That's a completely different thing. Then your objective is not comprehension. Your objective is pronunciation and intonation, read them maybe, you know, metric. But if, if, if your objective of assigning a reading to your students is the reading and understanding per se, then take that element out of the class. Send it in a WhatsApp message. And believe me, this happens, you know. This, your students will be reading that maybe three, four, five times. If they were interrupted on the third time, they will stop reading. They'll go back and they'll read it again. And that is proof. Research has shown that that actually happens. So, don't be a Richard. Don't just be amazed by all the technology that you have and getting a collection of tools, you know? Don't forget, technology, the T that you see there in the little drawing, you know? That T, it's, it's a tool. And that's what technology is. Technology, it's not replacing you. Technology is a tool. Be a Roger. Roger that? I mean, that's military talk, right? Roger that? Do you get that? Be a Roger. Use technology. Don't let technology use you like this poor Richard, you know. I mean, I, I think it's fantastic that you have all these technological tools being offered during these days. But I think it's also um, important for you to start thinking about when to use what. Takeaways. Technology is a tool. It's indispensable. Like, you can't do online teaching without technology. You just can't. The online teacher, you, you guys, you are, all of you guys are online teachers now. You must have technological knowledge. So if your technological knowledge is this big now, start increasing because it's just as important as the regular knowledge, but not more, okay? Pedagogy precedes technology. Like, if you don't know why, if you don't have a pedagogical reason for you choosing to choose certain technology, then don't. You see? The type of technology used depends on the objectives and the immediacy. Think about that, because immediacy, remember, it's closely related to bandwidth. So if you're teaching a class of students who don't have access to that much technology, there's a lot that you can still do with different technology that offers you like lower data consumption. Balance synchronous versus asynchronous. Remember, pre-recorded videos, pre-recorded audios, uh, readings outside the class. It's important so that your Zoom classes are more effective. And this is one of the most important things. Don't forget about the, the community that I told you. You still want your students to feel that they are part of the class. 
and you want to still be related to your colleagues. I love the idea when we start all of these uh, webinars that people start talking to each other, you know, they say, hello, 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 hello. That's fantastic because that's something that's not happening anymore. Okay, so that would be it for me. Please feel free to have a, a, a picture of this QR code to download the, the slides there, you know, just have a picture of it and you'll have access to all my slides. And, uh, and be in contact, you know, because I'm here to, to, to work with you. And, uh, and if you want to hear more about what we do at the embassy, that's another QR code so that you can receive our ELT newsletter and learn more from, from what we do. That's it. Daniela, I'm done. Okay, thank you, Gonzalo. Everything that you said means a lot to us. You reminded us of something very important, that the pedagogy behind technology in a virtual class. I'm sure we are going to start applying everything that we learned, technology, tools, everything, but as long as we know the purpose of our teaching. Thank you, Gonzalo. Very true. Daniela, if, if I can have this like one more minute, I, I see a very interesting question here by Denny Lara. She says like, yeah. we let students use technology? I'm talking about Google Translator since we cannot control them. It's easy for them to use it. What's your advice? You know, I, I have a rule. I don't know if you're uh, acquainted with, with Murphy's Law, but what, what can happen will happen. So, mm, yeah. Always think about that, you know, what, what can happen will happen. Like if your students, uh, you know, can use Google Translator, they will. It's not on you to, to, to like prevent that from happening. But what you can do, you see, is to have activities that take into account the possible use of the Google Translation, Translator. And you know, Google Translator is very good, but it's not perfect. So you start showing your students that how not perfect that is, then they will start using it less and less, you know? Actually, I think that we all use Google Translator at some point. So instead, instead of looking at it as an enemy, you said you said, have it as a friend, you see? Murphy's Law. If something can happen, it will. Okay, also very important to remember. Thank you, Gonzalo, for the answer and Denny for the question. Yes. On behalf of the CBA, I'd like to award you this certificate for participating in our academic conferences. This is the first time we have these virtual conferences and thank you, Gonzalo, for being part of them. We really appreciate it. Oh, that's very nice. Thank you. Thank you. I'm honored. <laughs> okay. Well, now I have some announcements for the audience. Please don't leave our YouTube channel yet because we will have a closing ceremony with our executive and academic directors. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And, and the moderators will also say something to the audience. Thank you, Gonzalo. See you on the next time. Right, thank you. It was a pleasure. Until next time. Until next time. Goodbye. Okay, so first of all, I would like to remind you about the attendance form. Don't forget to fill it out. I'm going to post it once again here. Okay. And first of all, I would like to invite our executive director who is here with us today, okay? Mr. Franz Gutierrez, okay? So, uh, well, not uh, uh, here he is. Thank you for joining this ceremony, Mr. Gutierrez. Hello, everyone. I hope you have enjoyed, and not only that, but have learned some things, some tricks that we usually have to do so for the benefit of our students. I want to thank, first of all, all the people who have attended, the people who have worked for this seminar, the first of a series. We hope it will be a future uh, next step. We have learned a lot during these days. 
because technology helps a lot. And that's what we're going to be using most of the time now. So now again, I would like to leave saying goodbye to all of you attendees, all the speakers, all the help, all the people that have really worked their butts off, <laughs> excuse the word, but I can see that you have really worked hard and you deserve some good applause. Thank you all for attending and I'll see you next time, I hope. Goodbye and Thank good luck. Thank you, Mr. Gutierrez. I would also like to invite our academic director, Jose Manuel, who would also speak a few words right, to all of us. Okay, thank you. Excellent work, Jose Manuel. I like it. I love thank it. You. Thank with you. With all the help with Danny and all the people that have helped you as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Franz Gutierrez. Thank you a lot. Your words mean a lot to me. Okay. Thank you and goodbye. Bye. Goodbye, Mr. Gutierrez. Okay, so I would uh, also like to invite our beloved moderators, uh, the, the ones that were part of this first academic virtual uh, conference. We have Manuel Hello. Cynthia Schmiro. Hello. Daniela Mendoza and myself, Daniela Licoña. Mm -hmm. okay. well, hi, everyone. I'd like to thank uh, the audience for being part of this event. I'd like to thank all the guest speakers. I thank Gonzalo Fortun, representing the U.S. Embassy in Bolivia, for all his support. I thank Pearson, Macmillan, and Partners of the Americas. I thank all the guest speakers, the CBA speakers, the moderators that also presented something their presentation were marvelous. I can say that uh, I learned a lot and I hope you teachers enjoyed this virtual conference as well. I hope to have more conferences like this in the future and I invite you to leave your comfort zone and become teacher trainers. I am sure all of you have something to share. I have to thank the moderators they did an excellent job and they helped me a lot. You know, this goes beyond work. This has to do with compromise. So I would like uh, to ask you, how did you enjoy this event? How did, you, how did you enjoy the first virtual conference? Well, it was difficult. We were nervous, yeah, <laughs> but I think everything really worked out well. We learn yeah. a lot and then we have the opportunity to share. Yep. At the beginning it was quite a little bit difficult, but then little by little we start getting used to it. And as Cynthia said, we have learned a lot. Thank you very much for sharing. Now um, we were really nervous, but I think I think we have learned a lot. And thank you very much. Yeah, it was a great opportunity. We have learned to be moderators as well. Yes, I, I felt very excited to be part of this event. And and also I was really nervous of making, uh, afraid of making mistakes, but <laughs> I think everything went very well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think everything went well. Uh, I, I would also like to thank some people uh, like Diego Revilla for all the ideas the logos and the amazing video about the history of the CBA. Mm -hmm. I also thank uh, mm -hmm. Lawrence Chavez and Arturo Saavedra for the construction of the web page and the creation of this YouTube channel that we used for the first time. And I think it worked pretty well. If you would okay. like to see these webinars again, uh, you just visit this, this channel and you will find all of them. And finally, I thank Omar Perez for designing the banner that we posted for you to learn more about the event. Uh, I think that with this, uh, we're done with this first virtual conference on digital tools, add-ons, educational. Yes, uh, Cynthia, you would like to say something. <laughs> yes, before you close everything and uh, 
this is for you because we would like to thank you on behalf of the CBA for being such a great leader that has shown us that there's nothing impossible and for teaching us that we can still be teachers no matter uh, no matter where we are. Thank you for your words. Thank you. Thank you. Also, well, I would like, uh, well, we would like to thank you for organizing this first uh, virtual academic conferences that puts the CBA once again on top of all the yeah. other institutions. Mm -hmm. Thank yes. you, Jose. And uh, thank you. Jose as well, thank you. We, would we would also like to thank you for your being, to, uh, for giving us the opportunity yes. to be part of this great event. Thank you very much. And uh, above all, we want to thank you for believing in us and for showing us that as a team, we can achieve many things. Thank you very much, Jose. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now, uh, thank you. And now, Danny, could you please help me <laughs> share my screen? Sure. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Is it there, okay. Ray? We have something for you. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a surprise, yeah. just yeah. in case. Yeah. This was yeah. not planned. For all the reasons that we have mentioned, for all the reasons that everyone knows on behalf of the CPA, and of course, you mm -hmm. also deserve more than a certificate. But we want to show you, we want to give you this certificate of appreciation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for organizing the first virtual conferences at the CDA and they were really successful. And a round of applause for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I don't know what to say. <laughs> you you surprised me there. You surprised me. But thank you. Thank you very much. I have no words to say how thankful I feel in this moment. And it's true. I believe in every one of you in all my TCs and all the teachers. That's why I invited all of them to be part of the next virtual conference because I know that all of you can do a marvelous job. If you are a CVA teacher, it's because you have something there. and you, All of you have something to, sh to share. Thank you very much. Uh, we're done with this. Thank you. <laughs> have a nice weekend. You do the same. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye, teachers. Bye bye. Thank you.